right. Well, hello and welcome, everyone. Um, tonight's topic is the six gates as a means of counteraction. And this is actually taken from a text by uh, Master G, uh, known as the Six Dharma Gates to the Sublime. But we're just looking at chapter four. And the reason for that is that I sort of have two purposes in this presentation. One of them is that I thought it might be useful to everyone to prevent, to present uh, sort of a bird's eye view of meditation practice in Tiantai and Tendai Buddhism. And so <clears throat> to that purpose, this chapter presents a sort of wide swath of different meditative strategies all together under this rubric of ways that you can counteract obstacles to awakening through meditation practice. And my other goal here is to um, basically show through the use of G's examples that Buddhist meditations uh, don't really need to be so uh, mystified or like hard to understand that in reality they're designed to be fairly practical and they all have sort of purposes behind them and things that they're trying to achieve. And then of course there's the disclaimer which is please don't take this general overview of meditation as a meditation short course. I'm not really going to be teaching you how to meditate during this. This is more about sort of understanding the basis for meditation. The way that we learn meditation is by actually doing meditation, which is something that we're going to do a little bit later this evening. So with that, let's talk about the core of Tiantai and thus Tendai meditation. So the type of meditation that we use is what is referred to as Shikan. And Shikan is actually a compound, which we can break up into uh, Shi, which is Shamata, or calming the mind, also known as cessation. And then Khan, which is uh, in Sanskrit, Vipassana, discerning the real, or contemplation. And these two elements uh, need to be brought together. Master G describes them as being like the wings of a bird. You can't just spend all of your time doing shamatha or all of your time doing vipassana. And if you spend too much time on one or the other, obviously the other one suffers. So why would we want to combine these two things? <clears throat> First of all, um, there's an image I love for shamatha, which is thinking about a sort of pool of water. And when all the sediment and stuff is kicked up in that pool, you can't see anything that's happening underneath the surface. And this is very much like the sense experiences that we have, that, are, that we experience through our, through our various sense bases, through the mind, when we're trying to meditate. And in daily life, we just kind of run around chasing all of those things and not necessarily getting a clear picture. So the goal of shamatha is to, to stop and to slow down and to let those things settle. And much like that body of water, when that sediment settles, then you're able to see everything that's going on in that pool of water. Now you might try various things. You get a snorkel, look underneath, etc. And these could be thought of as your different methods of contemplation. But this is the general idea of why we have these two components used together. Of course, this is only one way to break up meditative practice. And Another way is using the six gates, as GE does in this text. <clears throat> there. So just to briefly introduce them, and we're going to talk more about what each of the six gates is as we go with the examples, because I think that will be easier than going through them all twice. So. In the text, Master G sets out that the reason he uses these six gates is because these are the process that Shakyamuni Buddha used to awaken under the Bodhi tree. He started by counting the breath, then he moved to following the breath, then he moved to stabilization, contemplating the mind, what's called turning, this is to the root of the mind, and then a process of purification. And of course, um, the question inevitably comes up, why do we need six when we already have Shi and Khan? That's too much easier to understand. This does provide a little bit more detail, and Master G says that really breaking these up in all these different categories, we're still talking about the same things. It's just different ways of looking at them to help us gain insight into the details of them. So when we look at this list of six, we can actually understand that the first three constitute shamatha, chi, cessation. 
and that the second three would constitute con or contemplation. Of course, to make things nice and easy to understand, this is not always true. All of the ones that are considered contemplations can be used as a means of calming the mind, and all of the methods of cessation can be used as contemplations. But in a general sense, if you look at those first three, probably it's an 80-20 split. We're using those for shamatha, and then the latter three, about the same, we're using them for contemplation. <clears throat> so, these six gates are presented as countermeasures in the chapter that I'm looking at. They're also talked about in terms of sequential development, where you would start with one, go all the way to six. There's the reverse orientation, on and on and on, every version and permutation that you can imagine. We're focusing on the countermeasures because it's the easiest to understand, at least for me. So from here, I'm going to follow um, the path that Master G takes in this chapter. So he starts with a general clarification, and I think the clarification is actually sort of interesting. So first of all, we should understand that um, for Buddhist practitioners, sort of generally speaking, the truth about the nature of reality is not something that we create through knowledge or some process like that. It's something that is revealed by removing obstacles to being able to see it. And so in that sense, Master Ji writes, uh, as the practitioner of the three vehicles cultivates the path and converges with the truth, in every case this is an exercise in getting rid of obstacles and manifesting reality. There is nothing whatsoever which is being created in this endeavor. And in fact, he actually goes even farther in this section and says that properly applying the six gates as countermeasures against these obstacles is actually the entire Buddhist path. And that's not to say that um, there aren't other practices that we could engage in. What he's trying to show is the completeness of this method. So in other words, we could take the path of meditation as a complete way to awaken, but it's not the only one. <clears throat> So from here, we move into the sort of diagnostic criteria that Master G presents to us. And he divides up the obstacles to awakening into three different categories. The retribution-related obstacles, the affliction-related obstacles, and the karma-related obstacles. So, and this is the order he gives them in. Now, retribution-related, I think, is maybe a little bit misleading in the terminology that's used. When he describes the retribution-related obstacles, he says, they are just the unfortunate occurrences of this varied life and the scatteredness and confusion associated with coarse agitation. They constitute obstacles with respect to the sense realms and the sense bases. And so in that sense, I would like to sort of um, simplify this by saying that the retribution-related obstacles are really related to the senses. And that includes the mind, the thinking part of the mind as well. Now, the affliction-related obstacles... Excuse me, that's not self-explanatory. Could you tell them to say more? Yeah, sure, sure. So, what we're talking about when we look at the retribution-related obstacles is things like your mind running wild when you sit down, or a distracting noise, or, you know, a sensation that's bothering you or something like that. These are related to your sense experiences interfering with your ability to engage in contemplation. Okay. Okay, so good clarification question. And then moving on to the affliction-related obstacles, um, these are presented as the three poisons, which are, in the translation that we're using, um, he uses desire, hatred, and uh, delusive ignorance. Um, but we'll get more into those later. But you can kind of see that those have more of a tone of uh, sort of feeling or emotional states. And so, in that sense, I kind of look at these as maybe more like the emotional obstacles that we face when we're engaging in meditative practice. And then the last one, the explanation that we get is that these are just the effects of the bad karma obstructing the path which has arisen from past and present causes. During that period, when one still has not undergone the associated retribution, they're able to obstruct realization of the path of the noble ones, which is sort of circuitous, but what he's really getting at here is that 
we had the immediate presence of these issues related to our sense experiences and then also sort of to our emotional states. And then the other thing is sort of the residuals of the things that are going on outside of our time meditating, the things that are going on in our lives. And you'll see the what he presents as karma-related obstacles kind of appear to be sort of mixed states. But in that sense, I would associate them with past and present actions. So what we have are, are we having issues with a direct sense experience, something that's sort of a deep, deeper emotive kind of issue, or is it something that's resulting from some action that we've been taking? And don't worry, these will be clearer, I hope, with uh, some of the examples that he provides. So from here, we're actually just going to jump into the examples because I think they're very useful for trying to understand um, what he's getting at in this chapter. So the first obstacle that he mentions is what is called uncontrolled ideation. And this is probably something everyone who sat down to meditate is very familiar with. Um, not only are you engaging in uh, possibly some sort of discursive thinking, but also you find your mind jumping from one thing to the other. And we've often heard the image of uh, like a monkey jumping around in a tree, et cetera, or the notion of monkey mind. And this is what we're talking about uh, when we talk about uncontrolled ideation. And so of course the question is, if you're sitting trying to meditate, what do you do when this starts to happen? And the answer is probably the meditation method that everyone learned first, which is counting the breaths. And of course there's only one right way to do counting the breaths which is you breathe in and out, and when you finish the exhalation, you count one. You count from one up to 10. If you lose track, you start over. When you get to 10, you start back at one. Except that some people say you should always count in reverse order, and some people say count on the in-breath. Some people say count to 100. Uh, the text actually doesn't specify. He just says to count the breaths. And that's sort of the important part of this is you're using this counting as a tool to be able to rein in those thoughts and bring them back into a sort of channel where they're not just all over the place, where you're not just losing yourself. But from here, the next thing most people have probably experienced is dullness, drowsiness, and scatteredness, which is sort of a less uncontrolled ideation. So you probably get pretty good at counting your breaths, and then you find yourself waking up on the cushion, which is um, always a shocking experience. Um, or snoring. <laughs> or snoring. Uh, or you just kind of get like a fuzzy feeling. And um, the way that Master G sort of explains this for us to kind of diagnose when it's happening is he says that this term dullness is marked by the non-recalling mind, as in we're just kind of muddled in our sense of like where things are at and what's going on in the mind. Um, dimness, which is... Uh, as he says, marked by drowsiness, uh, and then scatteredness, which is sort of described as being like a floating or kind of skipping, running off sensation of one's thoughts, which is actually very similar to uncontrolled ideation. So in that sense, you could really use both of these methods to counter that. But if you have very uncontrolled ideation, it's much easier to count and then move on to following, for instance. Following is a little more subtle because you don't have the direct focus of the numbers. And the countermeasure for this is actually following the breaths. And there are a few different methods for this as well. Um, the one that's described in the text is focusing on the entering and exiting of the breath from the body, which many people say that you should focus on the nose, for instance, and the air coming in and out through the nostrils because this is sort of, it's a very subtle sensation, so it helps you hone in and focus but it also is uh, going to help you to some degree with that dullness and drowsiness, as opposed to just counting, which kind of becomes hip hypnotic at a certain point. And then this brings you to that restless feeling that you get, the feeling of urgency, coarseness, or a sort of rumination. And I think those are, um, well, he describes it as manifesting as a potentially like a coarseness of the breath where your breathing feels kind of like heavy or, or something like this. Togetherness, or together with uh, sort of scatteredness still existing and continuing in the flowing on of your thoughts, but still less severe than the previous two. And in this case, the countermeasure that's uh, suggested is what's called stabilization. 
And stabilization, he describes as stilling the mind. And to make sense of this a little bit, you have to think about the fact that if you were doing these sequentially, you're already in sort of a subtle state. You've already got some sort of relaxation of thoughts going. They've slowed down to some degree, and they're really not yanking you around as much. And so in that case, what you do is let them settle and just stop. And he describes this as sort of relaxing, right? Another strategy that I've heard that sort of can be used where following and stabilization are is um, if you feel yourself getting anxious or like wanting to move to focus your attention down to your center of gravity, which helps ground you to some degree. And then if you feel tired, bringing it back up to the nose, which sort of brings your energy back up to some degree and helps you stay awake, not get too tired. So these, these three are basically the main obstacles that he sees that shamatha is designed to deal with. And the reason we want to sort of stop all of these issues with our ideation being too tired, um, wanting to move around, etc., is so then we can move on to discerning the real or contemplation. And this is sort of the more transformative, I guess, part of meditative practice. So this is where we start to deal with the affliction-related obstacles. And the first one that we see is desire in the three poisons, desire or, or greed in some, some readings. And this doesn't have to be limited to just desire in a general sense of, uh, you know, wanting a piece of cake or whatever. It can be sort of any form of desire. So this doesn't preclude like things like sexual desire, etc., desire for some form of entertainment, desire to get off the cushion, etc. Now the countermeasure for this uh, involves contemplating the mind. So we've moved into the gate of contemplation, but specifically with respect to the impurity of the body. And when you think about it, it actually makes a little bit of sense, right? So the kind of desires that we're talking about are sort of desires that are predicated on short-term gratification, which is very much something that's going to be experienced bodily by us. We want it now. So the strategy is to do a contemplation that involves detaching oneself to some degree from the body. And in this case, um, everyone's favorite meditation is suggested, which is the nine contemplations on the unlovely, which is a nice way to put it, or also um, the nine contemplations on the decomposition of the body. So the idea being that um, you go through a series of contemplations, uh, basically working through your eventual death and the decomposition of your body. That's some strong medicine for desire. <laughs> but you have to think about the fact that it isn't something that you're supposed to just ruminate on forever now. It's something that when the issue arises, this is the way that you treat the obstacle, and then when it's no longer appropriate, you move on and you do something else. So from there, the next uh, obstacle that he identifies is hatred, the second of the three poisons. And this one, we're probably very familiar with meditations related to it. Um, can you click for me real quick? Thank you. And, um, that's, yeah, it's fine. Don't want everybody to see the answer to her. So, um, the cure for hatred is also another variation on contemplating the mind, but this time you're focusing more on compassion, and I'm using compassion a little bit as a shorthand here, because really we're talking about, um, compassion and metta, or loving-kindness meditations. So the meditations that are recommended in this particular instance uh, in the text are actually meditations on the Brahma Vihara, or the Four Immeasurable Minds, which consist of loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. But this doesn't preclude, for instance, the Metta meditation, which is a meditation that's geared specifically toward focusing on cultivating thoughts of loving kindness and extending them progressively out from oneself to people that you are close to, like family members, friends, acquaintances, difficult people, and then people you really just can't deal with. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, is, again, strong medicine, but I highly recommend uh, doing this meditation with some regularity, as it does actually work. 
um, even though you might feel like a little bit silly the first times you try it, you do actually see that it works. <clears throat> so moving on from here, the third of the three poisons is what we're calling delusive ignorance. And the cure for this is turning. And turning, I think, is one of the harder ones of these to understand. So the notion of turning, as Master G presents it, is that we're turning back to the root of the mind. And what this means is everything so far, we've been kind of focused on, on the outward, on like the sensory issues we're having, the thoughts we're having, the sort of feelings that we're having. And now we're turning backwards and we're looking in to where does all of this stuff come from? And so <clears throat> the suggested meditations that he considers to be part of this idea of turning to the root of the mind are meditations on things like the 12 causes and conditions, uh, the three emptinesses, um, emptiness, uh, signlessness, and wishlessness, um, or just meditations on emptiness in general, um, a much longer meditation on the 37 wings of enlightenment, basically anything that has us looking at the fundamental nature of the mind. So, for instance, when we get the meditation, uh, with no hindrance in the mind, no hindrance, therefore, no fear, far beyond deluded thoughts. This is nirvana. I would see that in many contexts as an example of turning. What we're doing is we're looking at emptiness as such and trying to understand that from the position that we currently have. And so what we're trying to overcome with this uh, poison of delusive ignorance is to move a little bit closer to not being ignorant of the way that things actually are. And so this is more based on sort of insight and, and being able to move forward on the path to awakening. So the karma-related obstacles, uh, let's remember, are related to the actions of the past and the present and how they're affecting our minds when we're trying to sit down and meditate. <clears throat> So the first state uh, that Master G gives as an example, and these are not exhaustive, he just gives these ones as examples, because you can see they're sort of mixed states. So in this, in this particular one, you're experiencing defiled thoughts involving mental turbidity, which that's the translation that's used. Um, turbidity means something like uh, muddy, foggy, or can also mean in turmoil. So you can sort of get an idea of what this would feel like to be in this state. <clears throat> so, the countermeasure that we use for this is the gate of purification. And the gate of purification is based on visualizing aspects of the Buddhas. So for this particular first one, um, it's described as a uh, visualization of the light emanating from the transformation body of a Buddha. And we should take a step back there and mention that, doctrinally speaking, there's a notion of Buddhas having three bodies. The transformation body, which is the appearance of a Buddha as a human-like being in a world. So Shakyamuni Buddha would be who we would be potentially visualizing in this particular scenario, but we're focusing on the light that emanates from Shakyamuni Buddha. In other words, his wisdom and purity of understanding. But then there are two other bodies that a Buddha is supposed to have. So for desire-related defiled thoughts, we move to a visualization of what are called uh, what's called the reward body of a Buddha. And so, for example, when we think of the sort of non-corporeal Buddhas like Amitabha, for instance, Amida Buddha, or Yashinyorai. Those are examples of reward body Buddhas. They're presented as idealized forms that come from other realms, but they're not incarnated as humans that have a historical presence on Earth, if that makes sense. So, for the sort of desire-related defiled thoughts, what we do is visualize Amida, or we can visualize Yakshin Yorai, etc. And we focus on their qualities. And that's because um, the qualities of the knowledge of all modes, 
um, which is sort of a form of omniscience, the ability to have deep understanding of the causation, uh, the fact that they have perfect purity because they exist in an idealized form, and then also that they have permanence and they exist in a state of bliss. So we're sort of trying to bring those qualities into our mind by visualizing those aspects of them. The abhorrent mind states, I myself am a little confused about what exactly he means when he says this. So, the description that Master Ji gives is that when one is sitting in dhyana meditation, signs may appear which are linked to all manner of abhorrent states of mind, which in the extreme case may even involve visions of subjection to physical and mental coercion. And one should realize that such signs are all a product of obstacles generated by unwholesome karmic actions committed in past and present lives. And so for me trying to think about what this looks like from my experience, I kind of imagine the sort of intrusive memories you have about events that kind of haunt you. You know, things that you maybe really wish you had done something differently, or it was just a terrible happening that it's kind of burned there in your brain and you have to live with it. And so these things can come and start to bother you when you're in meditation, right? Because you're in this very settled state. And so the countermeasure for this is again a different form of purification as the Dharma gate, but in this case, it's visualization of the Dharma body of a Buddha. And I think another way to say this, um, based on how Master Ji describes it, is that we're looking at the fundamental purity of all things in their manifestation of Buddha nature. When Sensei gives the meditation, all things are pure by nature, therefore I too am pure by nature. This is an example of a contemplation where the contemplation instruction is a phrase that's verbal, but what it's pointing to is this notion, the ultimate purity of nature itself, of reality as it is. Well, it actually sort of makes sense that when there are these things that really bother you on this deep down level, that understanding that one's Buddha nature is not some hidden separate thing, that you have direct access to this nature, to this dharma body at all times through this meditative visualization actually makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> So from here, Master G tries to sort of summarize the chapter, and it really is just a set of examples like this that he talks through. And the two headings that he has are regarding the sudden arising of obstacles and benefits of correct implementation. And the sudden arising of obstacles is a very short note that explains that basically, unless you reach a very high level of achievement through your meditative practice, these obstacles are going to keep coming up. And the answer is always, keep applying the medicine. It works. Apply it for as long as you need to, then move on. And you can just keep doing that, all the way to awakening. The other part of this is, of course, we have to have the benefits of correct implementation. And as we already know from the sort of intro to this, um, this resulted in Shakyamuni Buddha awakening under the Bodhi tree. And Master G basically says the same thing. If you continue to apply these countermeasures in your meditative practice, whenever the obstacles arise, you will eventually awaken. Probably not too surprising, considering that that was the impetus for writing this treatise. It's a guarantee. <laughs> not a long enough time scale, it is a guarantee. <laughs> no, it's not, it's not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed. <laughs> we, 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 don't issue, we don't issue a warranty on <laughs> Disclaimer. Disclaimers, yes. So really, um, reflections on this, uh, I'm going to be pretty, pretty brief with. So one of the main things I really wanted to, to show in this chapter is it's a very nuts and bolts chapter of this book, as opposed to a lot more sort of abstract meditation guides that we read. This one really just tells you, if this is happening, do this. If that's happening, do that. That's what it is. Apply the flowchart. Well, first learn the methods, but then apply them. So part of my part of my interest there was trying to sort of <clears throat> at least make you feel more comfortable with understanding the big picture of why we do these different contemplations and how these things relate to each other and how they can be applied, you know, if you're going through difficulties in your meditation practice or elsewhere. 
Now, the other thing I just wanted to bring up is something that was touched on last week during the sort of longer discussion question and answer session, which is that we often begin meditation as being uh, sort of self-directed. We're looking toward improving our situation. But the end result of all of these countermeasures and applying them is that it, it increases our ability to be other-oriented. And eventually we start applying these countermeasures on our own mental states for the benefit of others. And it has an effect on other people as well as ourselves. And this is a natural progression. And then finally, just to reemphasize, Master G says quite stridently at the beginning of this chapter that applying the six gates is the path. There is nothing else, it is the whole path. But we should understand that to mean that meditation can be a complete path in that you can have all of these elements in it. But at the end of the day, we're a multi-practice school. There are a lot of paths. Mm. We do all kinds of different things. And for a lot of people, meditation is very difficult. And maybe that's not the thing that gets them started. It's valuable, but it's not the only thing that we have. I put together a little collage of some of the things that we've done, like Sangha work days, uh, renewal of refuge ceremonies, uh, Tokido going down at the bottom. We have uh, our leader, John Seekwood, leading us in New York City on a climate march, and then uh, Sensei in Albany 